Hi, I'm Preston Williams, and welcome to another edition of Jazz Talk. Today on our show, we have with us one of the most gifted musicians on the scene today. This gentleman has been around for over 25 years and has worked with many greats from Max Roach to Joe Henderson, Dr. Billy Taylor, Herbie Hancock, uh, Lenny White, Buster Williams, I can go on and on, Shaka Khan, he's worked with everyone. He is a vibraphonist, composer, and educator. Please welcome to Jazz Talk, the legendary himself, Mr. Stefan Harris. Welcome, sir. Man, I appreciate that intro, but I'm too young. I'm going to hold up <laughs> my youth. I can't say legendary. I got to earn that, man. These guys on the wall, those are legends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you're, you're, hey, man, you're in that class, too, and uh, just uh, your your body of work and the people that you've worked with has just been so impressive. And I just wanted to know a little bit more about your humble beginnings. I understand that you're from Albany, New York. That's right, from upstate New York, born and raised. My, uh, my, my grandfather's from Albany, uh, so a couple generations on my father's side and my mother's side, they're from the, they're from uh, South Carolina. So yeah, yeah. Well, tell us, man, how did you get involved in music? Uh, because I understand that your uh, the main thing, I guess, that you wanted to do was play for the uh, be a member rather of the New York Philharmonic. But you heard some records by Charlie Parker and it just rocked your world, man. Tell us about that. Oh man, Charlie Parker was a problem for me. Man. <laughs> so I mean. First of all, my grandfather, his name was Pee Wee Harris, mm -hmm. he was a, 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 a great, great radio DJ uh, in upstate New York. He was one of the, the first to bring gospel music. He's one of the first station managers, African-American station managers, jazz, soul music to the upstate region. So I think there's, there's music in my blood. It's kind of in my family. My brother is actually a really amazing DJ also in Japan. Yeah. Okay. So as a little kid, I just always love music. I think it's very organic. Uh, and then my mother's a minister. So mm. I think, you know, when you when you kind of come up in the church and you hear music being played, that's coming from the heart. That's not about notes. That's ultimately about emotions and amplifying the spirits of people. Yeah. And that as a as a narrative and as a foundation, I think really helps set me up to uh, understand what my purpose is in art moving forward. So I think I had I had a really good a foundation culturally. And then in terms of jazz, I didn't I wasn't really exposed to jazz growing up. Um, I was playing classical music and fell in love with, you know, Beethoven and Stravinsky is one of my favorite composers. And my undergraduate degree in college is actually in uh, classical music. And it was my first year of college where I heard Charlie Parker for the first time. And it was like I said, it was a, it was a problem. <laughs> Thing about Bird. thing about Bird uh, is is uh, it was a problem for me on multiple levels, but primarily it was spiritual. Mm. Like hearing that type of authentic expression coming from a human being, it reminded me of church. And then the intellectual side of it completely floored me. I remember some students pulled me aside when I was at Eastman, and were just showing me like this is how the chord progression works. This is what he's playing and then he's reacting to what's happening in the room and the speed of, of interaction between him and Max, it just completely blew my mind. And I had to, I had to learn more. And that's why I moved to New York after my first year in Rochester. Yeah, it talked about genius, man, Charlie Parker. Now, uh, Stefan, what made you cho uh, choose the vibes, man, of all instruments? You know, it's funny. I, I like the vibes. The vibes are cool, but it's just a bunch of metal and wood, right? It's a pretty mm -hmm. instrument. I, I just love music. Um, so when I was a kid, I actually taught myself to read music at the piano. Uh, so when I went to elementary school to take lessons, I was already reading. So I was more advanced than the other kids. So I actually played, by the time I got to high school, I played 24 instruments. <laughs> so mm. I played in middle school, I played string bass, I played bassoon, I played French horn and orchestra. <laughs> in high school, I played sousaphone in the marching band and trombone. Mm -hmm. Clarinet was probably my second best instrument. So basically what happened for me, uh, I remember it vividly, it was Christmas Eve. I was in, in our little kitchen with my mama. She was cooking up dinner for the next day. And right. we had this little box, black and white TV sitting over in the corner. And there was this orchestra that came on. And it's called the Empire State Youth Orchestra. And it was all like, you know, middle school, high school kids playing this Christmas concert. And I was like, oh man, they're on this big stage. I, I want to join that band. And so I'm, I'm giving away my age now. I went and grabbed the phone book. 
right? And sort of found the Empire State Youth Orchestra and just called like a couple of days later. I said, man, my name is Stefan. I want to be in your band. Right? So I was in eighth grade at that time. And I ended up auditioning. They said, well, what do you play? I said, man, what do you, what do you have an opening for? <laughs> so I, they said, well, you pick two. So I auditioned on clarinet and I auditioned on percussion. I got alternate on clarinet and I got accepted as a percussionist. So really, that's why I became a vibraphonist. It was just, I got you. if I had gotten in as a clarinetist, I'd probably be playing clarinet today. <laughs> I got you. That that makes sense. And you know, one of the interesting things is you played uh, with some uh, heavyweights, man, earlier in your career. You know, what was it like working with someone like Max Roach, man? Man, I'm so clueless. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, music is so deep. I feel so clueless right now. I mean, I work every single day on trying to understand. And I feel like I get just a tiny little glimpse every every day. But the, the interesting thing for me is, is that I, I didn't come from a jazz background. Like mm -hmm. I said, I'm a, a Pentecostal minister. So I, I have a soulful background. Now. Right, right, right. But by the time I met Max Roach, it was, I had been playing jazz like two years or something. And I didn't really, you know, I didn't know a whole lot. I just was, I would go for it from the heart. So uh, I'll tell you, I, I was playing a gig with some friends of mine in, in Rochester, and they, they honored a teacher there who was friends with Max. So Max happened to be in the audience. I had no idea. So uh, this is me living in New York, flying up to Rochester for a gig with some college kids. Uh, so I go back, and then in, in New York, my answer machine, man, I'm giving my age away. The answer machine had, you know, a message, hey, kid. You know, I saw you give me a call. I want you to come out and play with it's Max. And so I'm like, come on, man. I told my roommate, stop messing with me, man. Stop Max Roach. Get out of here. And so I, I was, I just I didn't even respond. And he was like, no, I'm serious. So eventually I called back and it was he was like, Yeah, meet me Saturday at Harlem School of the Arts. And we're gonna be Gosh. in boom. And it, but again, I had been playing jazz for like two years or so. And I'll tell you, I know I'm I'm sort of going on. I, I'm in oh, it's, it's okay, I'm, man. I'm Max, I'll tell you a story, man. I went to that first rehearsal, man. Joe Chambers and all these cats are there. And Nashi Waits was in the group. I mean, incredible musicians. So I go in and I'm like, okay, Max Roach, man. That's like bebop and, you know, you got to know your stuff. Right. So he calls something and he points to me to take a solo. And I had been looking at some, checking out some Clifford Brown. So I was like, man, like it's Max Roach. I got to play some bebop stuff. And he literally stopped everybody and just laid into me boy, don't you ever play like that again. Like I have you here because of what I heard in you the other day. Don't copy people, you, you're you here to express what's authentic for you. I mean, it, and Max could be intense when he laid in. Yeah. So it was such a phenomenal lesson and at the perfect moment in my life that it's not about pleasing other people that ultimately it's about authenticity and telling the truth about the world that you have inhabited. Yeah, yeah, he wanted you to be you, you know? And uh, like you said, express yourself. But I'm sure when you look back now, Stefan, like, man, I played with Max Roach. How many people can say that? You know what I mean? That early in your career to play with a giant like that. Also, another uh, giant you work with, uh, Lionel Hampton. Man, what was it like working with him? I mean, it's it's a it's a thing of I'll tell you, I, I've gotten the same lesson. Well, you get a variety of lessons, but there's one lesson that's very consistent when you stand next to a genius like Lionel Hampton or Buster Williams or any of these people, Milt Jackson, the lesson I always got is that you shouldn't even try. Like, don't even try to be like them. When I first met Milt Jackson, I mean, it was like, it was in the way he walked. I mean, that brother was just smooth. It was the, it was the suit he had on. Like, <laughs> you are not going to, that's straight Detroit. There's nothing you could do about that. You're not going to swing like that. You're going to have to mm -hmm. go your own path. And right. again, it harkens back to that message that I think Max wanted to instill in me right away, playing with Joe Henderson. I think Buster Williams is, I mean, my greatest influence, you know, <laughs> but and spiritually where Buster always put me was in a space of be honest, tell the truth, be vulnerable, let go. It's not about mm -hmm. anything. It's not about the past. It's not even about the future. It's about right now. Right now. Yeah. Give because the world needs it. So for me, being around icons like that, it's incredibly humbling and it's really necessary for my development as a man. Mm, that's beautiful, man. I like that. And also uh, you work with uh, another great Dr. Billy Taylor. Um, fantastic, man. What was it? What was it like working with him and what did you learn from him? 
man, wow, this is deep. You're bringing up some heavy memories. Man. <laughs> <laughs> so it, this reminds me of, of, of the importance of cultural legacy, mm -hmm. right? the, the importance of having elders in our lives. Because we have lots of ideas, you know, you can have a vision of the world that you sort of built up from your experiences, which is valid. But when you meet someone with a great deal of life experience, it, it just changes your perspective. I'll tell you, before I got to play with Dr. Billy, Billy Taylor, he changed my life when I was in college. Mm. Uh, Manhattan School of Music, it must have been, I don't know, maybe my third year there. I was a classical music major, but really curious about jazz. So he came there to do a master class. And I remember sitting in the audience and this heavenly, elegant king gracefully just glided across the stage and communicated with such power, such passion, such clarity, mm. not only in terms of the, the, the language choice, because he was incredibly eloquent, but also the content and the clarity in which he delivered his ideas. I remember sitting there and I'll tell you, uh, he set a standard for me in how to communicate and how to be on stage and how to be present and engaging. And I'll, after I'd signed to Blue Note Records, maybe two years later or so, uh, I remember literally practicing communicating. I, it does, may not seem like it, but I'm a little bit of an introvert. <laughs> uh, I literally had to go to the bodega and just practice saying hello to people. So literally just start to, and then I would record myself speaking because I, I used to say, um, you know, know what I'm saying, blah, blah, blah. And I had to work on all of those important skills in order to right. be, But it started with seeing Dr. Billy Taylor to see like, this is a man. This is a, this is a grown up who is in control, who is, who is putting forth an image that sets up the bar incredibly high for all of us. And either you're going to rise to the occasion or not. So that's before I got to play a single note with him. And then when I got to play with him, it's just, yeah, it's, you know, it's like, I think about Winton. Winton was another great figure in my life. Uh, I, I often said like, Winton could see something in me before I could see it in myself. Mm. You know, like he, I'm like, why do you want me to play in your band? And I got the Martin E. Siegel Award through Winton and I, I didn't even understand it. I just knew I was gonna work hard and keep pushing. And the same thing, when I got to meet Billy Taylor in person at the Kennedy Center, it was just this incredible warm embrace. Like, you're going to be all right, young man, and we're going to help you, and we're going to take care of you. And it was just, I mean, those are things that have so much deeper than notes. Yeah, it's a very humbling experience. Like you said, these giants, they can see things in you. And I guess as a, a band leader, Miles Davis was notorious for that, seeing that in certain musicians, you know, he even said uh, that he had to push Wayne Shorter, who was a genius, because Wayne would sort of always lay back, was quiet, wouldn't say much, and he would look at the stuff that Wayne was writing. He says, man, you, you need to get out there and, and express yourself so people can see you. And But uh, no, I, I totally understand. You know, actually, one of the first times I think I heard you, Stefan, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was on Joe Henderson's Porgy and Beth. That was right around the time I think I heard you for the first time. And I says, man, this cat, this young cat is bad. And then I got a hold of Black Action Figure. Man, man. I love that recording. What were you trying to say on that? What is that, what is that all about, Black Action Figure? Wow. Well, first of all, thank you for that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, that was a spiritual breakthrough for me. Mm -hmm. So here I am. I'm this, this young man from Albany, New York. I grew up poor, right? You know, I didn't have a bunch of resources or anything. And I actually didn't even own an, a vibraphone until like, I don't know, my last year of college. So... <laughs> I, I just remember being in school and hanging out with Eric Harlan, Jason Moran, Eric mm. Lewis, all these people. I would, Eric Lewis would take me to the record store and say, man, you got to buy. This is McCoy Tyner. This mm. is how he's voicing it. And I just tried to learn from all of my peers as much as possible. And so I started writing music when I was a little kid. I didn't know about genre or anything like that. I was always writing music. Right. So in college, I started writing a bunch of songs as I was learning more jazz harmony. Most of the music that's on A Cloud of Red Dust, my first record, was mm -hmm. music that I wrote while I was in college. By the time I made that first record, I think my, my general sound was established as a composer, like who am I, what's my, my vision? But in terms of my playing, I was still sort of 
dealing with the core mechanics of here's this core change. You got to address all of these details. When I got to Black Action Figure, though, I, I was like, okay, I just graduated from college. I went to my big sister's house in New Jersey and I was like, can I stay in your guest room for three months? I'm going to write a record. And I went down there and I just completely let go. I, like, I don't care about any rules that came before. If it sounds good to me, I'm going to write it down. And the same thing happened in my playing. Mm -hmm. So there's a dramatic shift in my approach to playing from my first record of Cloud of Red Dust to Black Action Figure. And Black Action Figure is really, to me, it's the turning point. Like there's a song on there called Of Things to Come. And man, that's my jam, man. That's my that's the song that I love. I play that all the time, Stefan. That's my jam. Yeah. That's that's it has a pocket, certain type of harmonic movement that I I couldn't tell you theoretically what it was then, but I could hear it. And now you look at my band Blackout, you realize like that's the precursor to Blackout. I was always going in the direction that I'm going now. So that was a turning point for me, Black Action. Yeah, when I hear that. Cause it's like there's a lot going on. It's like, I mean, I love that song, man. But uh, you were grooving. But I was gonna say, Blue Note uh, was really happening at that time. There are a lot of young artists emerging, late '80s into the '90s, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Bruce Lundville was still president at that time, and he was very uh, open in, uh, you know, to young artists. Because I was talking to Cassandra Wilson about him. And uh, and that other uh, recording that you did is maybe my personal favorite, the uh, Grand um, Grand Unification Theory. That's it, Grand Unification Theory, man. I like that one too. That's a, a really important record for you. But uh, you know, even with Black Action Figure, I think you were nominated for a Grammy for that one too, weren't you? Yeah. 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 Very yeah. And fortunate journey. <laughs> yeah. That, like I said, yeah, that was that was really good stuff. And uh, I wanted to understand how uh, you got hooked up with. Um, pianist uh, Jackie Tearson. He's a friend of yours. You guys played together, I guess, early on. Tell me about Jackie, man. How'd you guys meet and start working together? Well, we were both on Blue Note. So that was okay. the connection. I had okay. a few records out on Blue Note. He had a he, he signed before me, so he had a, a, a long list of albums. We probably met at a party or something. And I mean, I had always been a fan. I love that song, Baby Plum, that mm -hmm. he wrote. Uh, and it was just one of those, man, we should really play together. And it was one of these things. I had a gig at the Vanguard or... Yeah. He had it and was like, let's get Jackie on this gig. Let's just try it. Had never played with him before. So night one at the Vanguard, Jackie walks on stage. We kind of look at each other like, all right, let's see what happens. It was literally within 30 seconds, we were dancing. We were interacting. Our ideas were flowing. It wasn't developmental at all. It was mm -hmm. really one of those like Jackie and I just have a certain connection that was in, that is incredibly special. And real, really, after the first song, it was obvious that we needed to make an album together. Sometimes, sometimes the music tells you what it needs. It usually does, actually, if you have a good ear. And it, yeah. it was clear that there's a lot that I could learn from him, um, and and learn well, actually, in terms of a direct conversation. But the experience of getting out on a limb with mm. somebody, he and I really, we had moments where like we don't know how we're going to get out of this mess. But we're in it together and we're going to dance and something and tarry on and taurus mateen it was just a phenomenal experience another one that was pivotal in terms of helping me understand how to let go in the moment and that you can't control the music you got to be vulnerable and fearless to be a part of this incredible tradition that these people created <laughs> without question you also uh brought up another fantastic musician who's a sort of a mentor for you buster williams i've had him on the show too uh, as well as Lenny, you know, I talked about when I saw uh, you with them a few years ago. Uh, how did you meet Buster? And, uh, you know, how did you guys get to work together? You know, that whole thing. I'm just curious because you guys seem to have a really good connection. When I saw the two of you performing together, I just felt almost like you guys had like a, a connection that's even beyond like the bandstand, the way you guys interact with each other. And that doesn't happen to a lot of musicians. There's something special uh, between you two. Tell me about Buster. Yeah, I mean, music is, <laughs> it's just a sonic manifestation of who you are. It's, mm. it's, uh, it's relationships de depicted in organized sound. And in and of itself, it's, you know, it's just a bunch of vibrations and metal and wood. It's not that deep. But that mm. relationship that, that I, I have with Buster uh, comes out clearly whenever we get the chance to work together. I'll tell you, the, the first time I met Buster was on the bandstand. Little mm. at, at a sweet basil, it's called back then, later, sweet rhythm in New York. 
Um, I was at Manhattan School of Music. Again, just getting started, <laughs> trying to figure it out. Steve Teray um, mm. was a professor there at the time and I had done something. Maybe I recorded on one of Steve Teray's albums and Buster needed someone to play. And I guess Steve had been talking to Buster and Buster heard about me from someone else and he just hired me without even hearing me. So I go down to Sweet Basil, I set up my vibes, there's no rehearsal. I mean, it's just kind of, all right, you all set up, you do a quick sound check. You got the music? Yes, sir. I got the charts here. Nice to meet you. Lenny White, Jerry Allen. Oh my God, I'm a college kid. Yeah. So I get on stage and, and this is one of the most beautifully traumatic experiences of my life. You know, Buster, I think, calls like a, a rhythm change in B flat. And he didn't play a single B flat the whole time. I mean, I'm thinking like, okay, we had improv class, you know, and Sonny Stitt kind of did this kind of thing. And it was like from beat one, Jerry, Buster, and Lenny were gone. They were like, boom. And then whatever happened next is what happened. And here mm. I am like, whoa. And I kind of look back and I remember Buster saying, you better, you better swim or sink. It's, you know, like, this is what it is. This is the music, go. And it was just like, okay, I had to dig deep. So that type of trial by fire with love is transformative. But Buster, I mean, I, I, I give him credit for just about everything I've done as a band leader, learning how to communicate, learning how to structure a set, understanding empathy, being able to feel an audience, understanding how to be yourself, regardless of what's happening in the room and how to communicate in the way that's appropriate while still remaining your authenticity. Buster, without saying a single word about it, taught me all about that and how to be a, and talk to me about being a husband and a father. So, I mean, I, I admire him greatly and I'm grateful to Jazz for having the opportunity to develop as a man with people like Buster. Mm, you know, you made me think of another individual who I had on the show and uh, Buster's had a tremendous uh, effect on her too, Regina Carter. It's like her mentor. And uh, we we talked about Buster. Now, Buster uh, is connected to so many people. And there's another musician, a uh, jazz icon that you work with, one of the greats of all time. And Buster had a tremendous effect on him too. You work with Herbie Hancock as well, man. Uh, what was it like working with Herbie? Well, I, I did a, I, uh, one of these, the Thelonious Monk Institute, which is now the, the Hancock Institute. Mm, right. We had a gala, uh, a big gala performance in LA and I was invited to be a part of, you know, play a couple songs with the ensemble. So it's like, it's it's Herbie, it's Wayne Shore, it's James Genius. I mean, it's, it's intense. So one of the things that I, I remember most about it is, is coming into the rehearsal and, and looking at how Herbie was looking at Wayne. Like Herbie has so much respect for Wayne. It was so much admiration and love and that deep connection that mm. they had. I don't know that I've ever seen that type of connection before. And it, it was in the playing, but it was also just in, in the way that they looked at each other. That completely blew my mind. And it just reminded me of the power of spirit, of relationships. It's bigger than just the notes. And then when you hear Herbie play and how he reacts to everything that's going on around him, it's not prescribed. It's kind of like wherever the music is, whatever is needed in this moment, whether it's been done before or not, it's going to happen. And he clearly sees that uh, as his responsibility. So the two of them, I mean, I think Herbie and Wayne and Buster, I mean, that generation, I mean, they have set the spiritual tone for us to understand our responsibility to the world. You know, mm. I'll yeah. tell you a quick, quick thought about Wayne, who I, I just, he's absolutely a genius. Uh, one of the things that was, that's so striking about him, I, I'll tell you two, two quick stories. I, I, I the night before, uh, John Beasley, who's a musical director, asked oh, I know me, John, yeah. Yeah, he said, hey man, you want to write an arrangement on this, uh, we were playing Flying Home or something. I was like, great. So I stay up all night. I put some sus chords in there to make it a little more modern. I'm like, it's Herbie, man. Let me. So I come into the rehearsal, you know, start passing out some charts and I go over the Wayne. I'm like, oh, Mr. Shorter, here's, here's the chart. And he's like, oh, no, no, I haven't read music in 17 years. 
<laughs> and it's like that that was transformative because I'm like all this music that this guy is making it's like the idea that music is, has nothing to do with what you can see music mm -hmm. is a science of sound and he completely lives in this in the space of sound and spirit and that which that just completely blew my mind as soon as you start playing the song what he came up with was a thousand times better than what I had on the paper anyway and then the other thing I was going to say about Wayne that I, I I found really fascinating was that, you know, you go around and people sort of take their solos and there's a general sound to each person. But every time it came to Wayne, it's like he would play something and I'm just like, I have no idea what he is thinking. Like, why did you play that? How did you come up with that? And it's perfect for the moment. So the idea that this is a guy who sees the world in a completely different light and is able to articulate that in music is just such an incredible inspiration. Yeah, yeah. And you think about uh, both of those guys working with Miles Davis, I'm sure they uh, they took a lot from from Miles as well. And I guess when you work with someone that closely for 50, 60 years, you guys probably know each other very well. You know, it's a deep, deep connection. Now, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about uh, is um, you're also an educator, man. And I guess you were visiting uh, instructor at Rutgers and you were also taught at New York University. Uh, do you still do that now? I mean, with COVID going on, are you teaching like online or, you know, um, doing anything like that? I am. I mean, if I really, <laughs> I, I don't think it's necessary to rigidly define oneself, but I'll tell you one of my deepest passions in life is education. Yeah. Oh, we, we know this. Yeah. I love, love teaching. I find teaching to be equally as uh, gratifying, creatively challenging, spiritually fulfilling as I do performing or anything else I do in my life. Um, so yeah, I taught at NYU. I was just a, the associate dean and director of the jazz department at Manhattan School of Music. That was my last position. And mm -hmm. now I'm a professor at Rutgers University in Newark. So I'm still teaching online uh, because of COVID. Uh, but the big shift that I've made, which I'm really excited about, at NYU, at Manhattan School, I taught at the Brubeck Institute. Those are sort of conservatory level musicians. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to uh, find a way to be in my own community <laughs> where my Nana lives, my cousins, you know, my nieces, and uh, make sure that I'm giving back and growing, utilizing the power of art from community outward. So it wasn't just about being at an elite with the best musicians in the world. I wanted to do it in my own community. So I decided to come back to the city of Newark and sort of work here. And it has been amazing. Wow. Like one of the theory classes I'm teaching, you know, 90, probably 90% 90 of the kids have never played an instrument before. Don't read music, none of that. And I'm like, yes, like I came into it and I was like, oh yeah, I have my syllabus and then I started realizing where people were and I had to be creative. I had to draw on all my experience and be humbled and say, okay, my responsibility is to help them. Doesn't yeah. matter what I know or what I think should happen. Here, here is wh here's where they are. They obviously have something to say about this world. My responsibility is to put the tools of, of music, of creativity in their hands so they can tell the truth about what's happening in our world, in our communities. So I'm, I'm, 100% in with education. And even, you know, I have an app, uh, Harmony Cloud, mm -hmm. even developing apps is all about unlocking potential in other people, but not just the elite. I can work with high level musicians, but I'm telling you, I've had kids who never played before that by the end of the semester created the most beautiful melodies and music from the heart. And when they, when they talk about what music means to them, it was such a different thing than what you know, someone who had been playing music for 15 years would say, and it's just been amazing and incredibly humbling. You know, Stefan, you've had such a, an amazing career. You've been out there for what, 25, 30 years, man. And uh, you've worked with so many great musicians, won so many jazz polls, downbeat jazz times. I mean, you've done, done it all. Uh, one of the things that I was really impressed by is uh, you were a recipient of the 2018 Doris Duke Awards, which was amazing. And uh, I had someone on who actually won that, Regina Carter again. She and I talked about it, but that must have, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that must have been a huge highlight for you, man, in your career to even be a recipient of that because that's that's pretty big. Oh, I mean, it's it's 
incredibly humbling. Uh, I'm very grateful. And again, these things, I think sometimes things come to you at the right moment, as long as you're paying attention and you can recognize it. Uh, it <laughs> so like I said, in some ways I'm kind of introverted. So even as an artist, like I actually don't want to be on tour all the time. Like yeah. I have a wife, I have kids, I have so much work to do in the area of education and app development so that I can help other people unlock their potential. For mm -hmm. me to be traveling all the time, I don't have any interest in being a big star or anything like that. I'm not motivated by that. So in some ways I can kind of fly under the radar. You know, I'll let a decade go between albums if that's what's necessary because I'm working on other things. Um, so to receive an award like that was really a serious acknowledgement that what I'm doing is having an impact yeah. in music, not just the work in education and apps and corporate talks and all that other stuff. The actual work in music is making a difference in matters. And I also think um, what, what an award like that does is it, it, it's sort of, it's like pouring gasoline on the fire. Like mm -hmm. there are things that I really want to accomplish with my time on the planet that I'm working really hard to do. I think receiving that award gave me a deeper sense of permission to go ahead and just close out some other things and really focus on what's gonna make you proud at the end of your time on this planet. What am I gonna say I did where I look back and I'm gonna say it was worth it. And that's what I'm doing right now. And the, the Doris Duke Award is definitely a big part of what gave me the courage and resources to make the types of moves I needed to make. Yeah, yeah. I was also gonna ask you about uh, another artist. What was it like working with Shaka Khan, man? <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, like, what can you say? I mean, that voice, that presence, it's, it's, it's the same thing. It's like you, you realize a good friend of mine, Wayne Winborn, he's the uh, director of the Institute of Jazz Studies in Newark. He always says, this, life ain't fair. Like, meaning like some people just have it. There's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> and Shaka Khan, I mean, she walks in the room, that energy, she just, it's, it's just something she was, I'm sure she worked at it, but there's something deeper than the voice that she carries with her. And then when she sings, it's just, we, I think we did something at Carnegie Hall, maybe, yeah, with Joe Henderson. I mean, she filled that whole hall like a, an opera singer, <laughs> you know, yeah. with all that soul. But just, I know. I mean, it's, it's, it's again, it, it's the lesson remains the same. There's no one to chase but yourself. Yeah, yeah. You know, also, Stefana, something that you did, a recording that you did that I liked, uh, 90 Miles uh, with Christian Scott. And I think there was like a little documentary or film on that, too, man. That was nice. It was really nice. Uh, what was it like recording that in, uh, I guess you guys were in what, uh, Havana, Cuba? Yeah, uh, we were down to Cuba, uh, uh, Christian and David Sanchez. Uh, that was really cool because it was one of those things where right up until a, two days before, it was like, we don't know if we're going to be allowed to go down. Right. Did we purchase the flight yet? What's going on? There's some government issue. And apparently it was an idea that was brought up by the record company maybe a year earlier, mm -hmm. but the, the United States government said it wasn't a good time to do it. So eventually we got approval and sure enough, like two days before, we're like, okay, it's actually going to happen. So it was like, I'm going to write something real quick. I wrote this song, Brown Bell Blues, two days before. So, so we fly down to Cuba and then we meet the other, the Cuban musicians that day. And we just sit around and just went to someone's house and had a bite to eat. And, you know, I speak a little Spanish, but not enough to be really, you know, getting into right, it. Right. So we met each other and then it was like, okay, let's go to the studio and let's see what happens. Having never played together. But again, that's the power of music. It's, you can have disparate perspectives come together and the real power actually lies in, lies in between those disparate perspectives. So it was beautiful, man. And, and also the thing about Cuba is you're reminded of a situation where music is a part of people's everyday lives. It's not just for the elite. It's not great. Right. Like, I'm great and I can afford to go to Carnegie Hall or somewhere else to see. It's like, no, man, rhythm is in every facet of that community down there. So it was, it was an incredible experience. That's beautiful. Now, I was going to ask you, uh, whenever you do have spare time and you're just at home relaxing, maybe with the kids or the wife, and you have some music on, what, what are you listening to? What is Stefan Harris checking out? Do you put some old stuff on, like some Bud Powell and Thelonious Monk or some new stuff, you know, with Robert Glasper or your own stuff? What are you listening to, man? Wow, that's really interesting, man. You know, I, I actually don't listen to a whole lot of music, which mm -hmm. is 
interesting. Like music for me, because I work in music all day, hour yeah. after hour, like I'm working on harmony as I'm developing this, this app. Um, a lot of times I need like a sonic break. So I use music for specific functional moments, probably just like someone who's not a musician. Mm -hmm. So if, if, you, if you had to identify who's on my playlist the most, it would definitely be Stevie Wonder yeah. to this day. I mean, you know what I mean? It's just, but I, I'll go back and I like, I like phases, right? So when we have dinner, I'm like, okay, Alexa, play, uh, you know, Italian dinner music or something. <laughs> Or I love Mahler. So there are times where I'll ask for some Mahler to be played. Uh, in terms of jazz, the most recent stuff I was checking out was Mingus. Because mm. you know? I, I didn't listen to a whole lot of Mingus coming up, but I think my intuition and my understanding of the music is getting deeper beyond, beyond the, the mechanics of the music. And once you start to hear like that, you can, you can really hear the majesty of Mingus' writing and the way his ensembles play together. So I'm really appreciating that sense of, of, of community and the, the, um, the power that Ming has had to be fearless and let the music be what it needed to be. Yeah. I like, in short, I like all kinds of music, but it just right. depends on what I'm doing at the moment. I rarely sit down just to listen to music. It's usually something else going on. Yeah. Yeah. Are you down with the avant-garde? you like stuff like Cecil Taylor or Albert Eiler, stuff like that? I mean, like I said, to me, music is a, is a sonic manifestation of relationships, of what's happening in, 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 in the moment. And I think any young musician, certainly in jazz, you have to experience that sort of avant-garde moment because it's one of the most honest moments you're going to deal with in music. Like, mm. if you don't know what the key is, you know, you don't exactly know what the tempo is. The more information that you're lacking, the more you actually have to listen, the more you have to be empathetic, the more you have to be humble, right? So if I come into a situation and we're playing a style, let's say we're playing bebop and we're playing the B-flat rhythm change, let's say, I'm like, all right, you transcribe Sonny Stead, you got all the licks, you know what's gonna happen, you know the tempo, the tune, you actually don't really have to listen. You can just sort of regurgitate all the stuff you've worked on so I think it's a, it's a critical part of anyone's development that you're able to walk into a room with other people and not what's going not know what's going to happen, right? And just struggle. <laughs> you know that's how you develop that fearlessness where you get on stage with Buster and it is a rhythm change, but not really. <laughs> you know it's funny. You made me think of Miles Davis. I had talked to Dave Holland and Buster, and uh, Dave Holland would say that at the very last minute before they would go on stage, Miles Davis would change the tunes. And he says, I pay you to practice on the bandstand, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> that's, a, that's a lesson. But listen, man, I wanna thank you so much for being on Jazz Talk. You're a class act, love you, love your music, and just thank you for sharing this time and space with me. Hang on, I'm about to close out the show. Well, you've heard it from Stefan Harris, and as the saying goes, if the music grooves and makes you move, it must be jazz. I'm Preston Williams with Jazz Talk signing off. Peace.